dear church, a very good day to you. 1998 was an interesting year for me where I remember countdowns as having important places in my life. Two particular countdowns which served as good reminders for me. The first countdown was a 30-day countdown counting down to the 1998 France World Cup. I remember it so clearly uh, during that time, I would buy the new paper, which is the paper for football news, right? I would buy it every day because on the byline, a big byline there on the front page was a 30-day countdown. Counting down every time and each day there would be a feature on a different team, etc. It was exciting. I was beginning to love football and that provided me, that countdown reminded me of the teams that were playing, the players who were featured. And I think it was the first time, at least to my memory, that uh, the media companies were going to air the quarterfinals and above free for everyone. And I was so excited. So every time I saw the reminder of the countdown, the 30-day countdown, it got me excited and excited and excited for FIFA 98, uh, well, World Cup 98 France. But 998 also had a countdown that I really, really disliked. This was the 100-day countdown to my old levels. The school plastered that countdown in the cafeteria, in the canteen, and every time we walked past it, it would never fail to remind the old level students that your old levels were drawing near. And totally unlike the 30-day countdown for the FIFA World Cup, this countdown, this 100-day countdown filled me with dread. As it, it went closer and closer, it just got the nervousness higher and higher to the point that, you know, and students here, I think you empathize with me, after a while, the reminder of the countdown became an eyesore and I did not want to see it at all. But there it was, right in front of me in the cafeteria. There are days where then I'll just close my eyes, look down, don't even want to see that reminder of a countdown, just proceed on because I totally disliked this reminder right in front of me. I just wanted my old levels to be over. Reminders. Some we like, some we don't. And Peter, in his second epistle, does it again. In this second Peter chapter 3 that we're covering today, he wants to remind us again like he did remind us in chapter 1. In chapter 1, he wanted to remind and stir the Christians by way of reminder that they had every spiritual blessing in Christ. And here again in chapter 3, he wanted to remind the Christians of something fundamentally important in their faith journey. What is it he wanted to remind them of? Well, after exposing the false teachers that were among them in chapter 2, this reminder that Peter adopted was what I call pastorally firm. He urged the church to not to follow those false teachers, to, to go away from them because he didn't want to be influenced by these false teachers. They were heading for judgment. But there was also a tenderness even in this pastoral firmness. He called his readers here beloved four times in this chapter. He cares for them and he also assured them that they were of sincere mind. Once again, he wanted to stir them up by way of reminder, like in chapter 1, to zoom in and stand firmly by God's word, lest they be deceived by the false teachers and the scoffers that we read, and hopefully they won't fall and slide into becoming one of the scoffers themselves. So allow me to case start today by reading from the scripture today and then open us in prayer. Let's read from 2 Peter 1, uh, 2 Peter 3, verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, 
and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Verse 8, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we are listening to this at home, on YouTube, Holy Spirit, I ask that you do your work of transformation. May we heed the reminders that Holy Spirit, you are bringing to our minds and heart this day. Grant us humility. Give us grace, dear Lord. What we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, transform us. All by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So what is it that Peter wants to remind us of in 2 Peter chapter 3? Well, first of all, he tells believers, Christians, all of us, that as believers, we must heed reminders and we must remember the word, verses 1 to 2. Peter wrote to an audience who had yet to receive the privilege of the Holy Bible, the scriptures that we understand it to be today. In those days, scripture had yet to be compiled, and so he was being specific to his readers. He was intentionally linking the Old Testament, described here as the predictions of the Holy Prophets, and he was linking with the New Testament, the commandment of the Lord, Savior, Lord and Savior through your apostles. During that time that 2 Peter was circulating, um, other earlier books of the Gospels were circulating. And Peter was telling the Christians then, and us today, please, please, remember the Scriptures. Remember them. We heed what is written in the Scriptures as good reminders for each one of you. Memorize, love these Scriptures. Now, if you find what I'm saying very familiar, you're right, because this is what Elder Ronald reminded us of three weeks ago. And he gave us great application points and exhorted us to do good things that I do want us to remind us to. And you can see on slide here some of these good things that he exhorted us to do. And I urge us to continue on these application points. If you started something great, you know, continue in them, build up that good habit and spiritual discipline. But here in chapter 3, Peter wanted to zoom in on something specific about the word, about this immediate context of 2 Peter chapter 3. And that is this. The reality that we do not naturally gravitate toward God's word and our natural self is ready to slide into sin. Once again, the reality that we do not, we do not, naturally gravitate towards God's word, but our natural selves will slide into sin. That's why we need to remember God's word and keep the reminders that come on us that God gives to us. He makes a dis- and here, he makes a distinct and intentional contrast between believers who love God's word, who remember God's word, reminded themselves of it, and the scoffers attitude toward the word. These two are intentionally in contrast to one another. As I said, believers are called to remind ourselves of the word and remember the word. But the scoffers that he talks about that we read earlier on, they are the total opposite, the antithesis of what it means to to be a believer of Christ. Not only do you not heed the reminders 
these were scoffers who mock these reminders. These were scoffers who not only did not remember God's word, they purposefully, intentionally did not want to remember. It wasn't about doubt here. It's about purposely not remembering scripture and putting it one side. This is the contrast between believers and the scoffers that Peter wanted to paint for us today. And so therefore, there was this pastoral firmness and warning that Peter gives to us. Dear friends, God is reminding us to heed these reminders. Remember God's word because if not, we are prone to move to the spiritual sliding. Sliding into our sinful desires. We are prone to sin. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible. 176 verses. And it's a psalm that many of us know portions of it. Beautiful psalm. Because it's a psalm that focuses its reader and listener on the beauty of God's word and the delight that we should have in God's word to store up God's word in our hearts, to remember, to delight in it. But verse 9 to 11, as I was beginning, I'm learning to memorize it again, and I read it for us, something fresh popped out to me. Let me read verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The gain that we have that Psalm 119 puts in pains in place here, the gain that we have is not just about loving God, knowing God. Very true, very needed. The gain that we have here is not just a shalom and peace that comes upon us when God's word is read to us and we remain on God's word. That's very good. The gain and the need for us to store up God's word, to meditate on it, to love it, the gain actually here it's so clear that we might not sin against God. The gain that we have in storing up God's word and remembering and reminding ourselves of it is so that we keep our way pure. The last verse of this very long Psalm 119, verse 176, after all the expression of loving God's word and needing it to be part of our DNA, the last verse here is a sombering recognition of the wretched state of man. Psalm 119 verse 176 reads, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, O Lord, for I do not forget your commandments. In this beautifully lengthy poetic psalm, the psalmist recognizes at the end of the day that if left to his own devices, if we are left to our own natural inclination, we will go astray like lost sheep. We would be prone to wander. W-A-N-D-E-R. As the chorus of that hymn goes, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, Take it and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. Dear friends, Peter reminds us that we need to cherish and heed these reminders that may these reminders that come in our sermons, in our scripture reading, in our daily devotional time to the Lord, may we not brush them aside like how I brush aside the reminders of our O levels because we would naturally gravitate towards sin. And we need the word of God as handrails, as guardrails to keep us on that track. The question that I have for us today is that are we intentionally taking steps to grow toward loving God's word? Because if we don't, we will slide into sin and then become the very scoffers that Peter warns us against in verse 3 to 7. Because these scoffers, as I said, are the exact opposite of believers. For these scoffers mock and deliberately forget God's word. Dear friends, the next couple of points that in this section might not 
apply to each and every one of you specifically. But I still raise them up because some of these characteristics of these scoffers, they are very slippery slopes that we as Christians are very prone to as well. And we need to watch out for them. So, as also in 1 Peter, we are in these last days, characterized by the first coming of Christ, bounded together by the second coming of Christ. First coming, second coming, in between, these are the last days. And so Peter says that in these last days, scoffers will come and they will mock God's word and then deliberately ignore certain parts of it. And by doing so, they're basically attacking God's very character and mocking God himself. What? Now, what is their mocking about? Uh, allow me to maybe describe this in um, colloquial language, in something a bit more singlish that you might understand, okay? Now, this is what, this is what these scoffers are saying in a singable version. Now, this is what they're saying. You Christians, uh, you all say that Jesus is coming again to judge the world. Where God? From the time of our ancestors till now, Nothing happened. The world is still spinning. Life goes on. God never did anything. What? You look at, you look at all the bad things happening out there. God never, think, not, God never do anything to correct them. So since he never do anything, you think Jesus is coming again, man? Please, lah, forget it. Don't live your life expecting Christ to come again. Judge. Judge what? Judge. He never come before. Don't believe in all that nonsense. Now, what's important, I tell you? What's important? Live for today. Happy can already. That's what they were saying. The English Standard Version puts it as they deliberately, intentionally overlooked this fact. And this phrase, they deliberately overlook, basically what he was trying to say is that in their desire to forget the fact that Christ is coming again, to forget that Christ is going to intervene in world history in a future judgment, they purposefully, intentionally forgot and overlook and put under the carpet, sweep it under there, two important events, two important areas that God has already intervened in world history. And these two events are the creation of the world and the flood. They, they purposely wanted to forget the creation of the world because the creation of the world really is a dramatic demonstration of the power of God's word. When God said, let there be light, God spoke and he spoke creation into existence. God's word transformed a mess of, of nothingness into the world, the complex world that we live in today. This complex world that sustains life. It is this same word of God then, which we see in the first judgment, the mass judgment of the world seen in the flood. This flood was God's intervention on seeing the depravity, the sin of man. And by the same word of God, Second Peter tells us, this process of creation was reversed. Why this same word, the land was covered with water and all life was destroyed, save for those on the ark. Second Peter, Second Peter 3, 5 to 7 shows us and tells us that the flood, this first judgment, is a foreshadowing of the final judgment when Christ will come again. Once again, the word of God that created and sustained all life is the same word in which all life was destroyed. Creation and the flood both involve water and God was telling us that this is a foreshadow of the coming of Christ this time where the same word brings not water but fire. The coming of Christ where the present heaven and earth are being reserved from fire and judgment. And all that it will take is that very same word that God made at creation and at the flood. And these scoffers were mocking this word. They literally forgot that the flood happened. 
They forgot that the flood was God's intervening and coming into the world to remind the world that His word will stand. And because He says that He will come again, that certainty would happen. It's just a matter of when and God's perfect timing. These scoffers wanted to forget all of that and then focus primarily on what's going to happen in the here and now, what's going to happen in how we lead our life, where this life on this earth that we lead is what's important. I'm going to ignore all that and focus on the world and how to live the world, how to live in this world by my own worldviews. Because scoffers, they place human understanding and experience above the authority of God. These scoffers that Peter talks about, they place human understanding and experience above the authority of God. Now, as I said, for some, many of us, we, we're probably not scoffers in that sense, not in the way Peter talks about at least. But how often have we put our own human wisdom above God's word? How often have we deliberately put aside and not want to think about God's word, knowing that actually we are falling into disobedience, just following our own sinful desires. How often do we, when we wake up, and I speak for myself, know that we're in an ugly place and there's this dryness in our hearts where we don't want to seek God's word because it's just going to come and convict us and we don't want to have that conviction and put it aside and instead of reaching for our Bibles, instead of reaching for God's Word in the day-to-day, -day, instead of seeking God's direction in where to head to in our families, to lead our families, in our marriages, in our careers, we turn to our own judgments, the world's authorities. We turn even to recreation. The idea of even turning this is not new, turning to sports news or the news before even we begin and anchor our day in God's word. Do we put our own understanding and experience above God's authority in his word? Because the scoffers do. But Lord, God is patient. And God is kind. And so Peter continues in his, in his line of refuting an argument towards these scoffers. They are saying that because we didn't see all this happen, so it didn't happen, so it's not going to happen. They purposely didn't want to remember the flood. And so by saying that, they're saying God's return will not come. But Peter wants to remind them in verse 8, and now he switches to the Christians now, do not overlook this fact, beloved, to the Christians. With the Lord, one day is a thousand years, a thousand years, as one day. He unpacks now, Peter unpacks now, God's patience and perspective on time. And through this, to remind us that God's patience and perspective of time are opportunities for our repentance. Now, before we unpack this verse in the scheme of the things, allow me to address what it actually is, because through the years, uh, we sometimes misunderstand this verse a little bit. Now, first of all, some of us have a misunderstanding that verse 8, that if the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, we misunderstand it and we, we, we use it like a formula, one day equal 1,000 and, and vice versa. Uh, and we even use this to apply to other areas of Scripture. So there is an, an erroneous, and I would dare say there's an erroneous area of teaching that says, I'm going to apply this to the creation account in Genesis. So therefore, God created the world. I, I count, 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 a couple thousand years because in Peter it says one day equal thousand years. Now, that, that's not how, that's not how we're supposed to apply this scripture. You know, if you apply this scripture, then um, let me tell you a story. There was this economist, there was this economist who read this passage and the economist, he, he was quite amused, amazed actually, not just amused, amazed and he spoke to God about it, you know, and this economist was telling the Lord, Lord, is it true that a thousand years to you is, is like, it's like a minute? And the Lord right here and said, yes. And the economist said, then, then does it mean that a million dollars to, to, to us is like a penny to you? 
And the Lord said, well, well, yes. Then the economist said, well, since a million dollars to us is like a penny to you, God, would you give me one of those pennies? And God, in teaching the economist, said, all right, I will. You just wait here a minute. Okay. Charles Spurgeon, regarded by many as one of the most gifted preachers ever, he helped explain this phrase with the Lord a day, one day is like a thousand years like this. He observes that God and his divine power, divine wisdom, he can make a single day as useful in his purposes as it, as it would take a thousand years to produce. He can make a single day as useful, as productive in his purposes as it would take us a thousand years to produce. For example, when the Lord sends a revival through his people, thousands may come to know the Lord in that short time. Whereas under normal circumstances, it might take us really many, many years to see this same thousand come to know Jesus. But yet on the other side of things, a thousand years can be like one day. Paul briefly talks about this in Galatians 4 verse 4 when he says that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Born of woman, born under the law. Between the time of the last prophet to when Christ Christ's birth, that was 400 years. And we might wonder to ourselves, why so long, Lord? Why 400 years? But in God's eyes, in the fullness of time had to pass. When Christ came again, it was right on God's schedule. Second Peter 3 verse, it has to be seen as, as an analogy, not a literal equation. For us human beings, we see time as a very valuable commodity. But with God, it's, it's really not a great issue. Yes, of course, God deals with time, but God is way above and outside of time. And God has a totally different perspective of time. The way we view time is really different from the way He views time. And His timing is always the right time. No matter what the two hands of our watch will say. And when Peter wrote this, little phrase, he had in mind scripture. He was basically paraphrasing and borrowing from what Moses wrote in Psalm 90, a psalm that calls for us to number our days. Let me read verse 2 to 4 in Psalm 90 for you. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return men to dust and say, return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight, uh, but as yesterday, when it's past, or as a watch in the night. Peter borrows this picture from Psalm 90, because in Psalm 90, Moses uses the picture of the mountains. Something we humans, look, we look at the mountains, we look at the hills and we say, this is amazing and awesome. And the mountains to us signify stability, signifies certainty in a huge expense of time. The mountains in their physical might and grandeur remind us of how little and punitive we are. And Moses looks at these mountains, calls us to focus on them and says, before these mountains are brought forth, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God does not measure time by human standards. And we then, as a response, we must adjust ourselves to God's way of time and not expect Him to live by ours. We must adjust ourselves to God's way of time and not expect Him to live by ours. He will do things in His timing and we have to wait. And so because of this long waiting period, these scoffers are saying, so therefore Christ is not going to come again. It's like saying, if your school, for example, if you're secondary school and your school doesn't do anything to prepare for O-levels, it might lead you to wonder, are the O-levels really going to happen? If there was no publicity and write-up in the papers and social media about a coming World Cup, it might lead us to wonder, wait a minute, is the World Cup really happening? 
because there will be so much talk about it. That's what they were saying. Because you never heard anything, Christ not coming again. But of course, they failed to forget. They, they failed to not remember the flood. And so Peter is saying here, you think that there is a delay in timing? There is no delay. God is coming in his perfect timing. And in fact, if you think there's a delay that, God is, that Christ is stretching, if you think so, it's only because God is being patient toward us. Peter says this, don't try to gauge on your timing, this length of time that we have, every new day, every time that is delayed, is an opportunity, a fresh new day we experience God's mercies so that we might come to repentance. Scripture says that the mercies of God are new every day. Every morning is a new opportunity given by God to us to live as Christ-like people, to repent of the sins that we recognize are in our hearts, an, an opportunity to, to bring to light the things that we shoved away and to say, God, I need to start anew and come afresh with you. That's God being patient with us. God is not slow to fulfill His promises, but is patient toward us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Dear friends, I close with this point. God is trying to tell us in this delay that He is coming again soon. Time, while we don't know when, it is getting shorter and shorter. God is saying to us, every new day that comes is a reminder to you that I'm coming again. How are you going to lead your life? Every fresh reminder that is given to you and I in God's word, in the exhortation of someone else, is a fresh opportunity for you and I to come before the Lord in repentance and say, Lord, help me turn my life anew in this area of my life. Help me surrender it to you so I can follow in your ways. Help me to heed these reminders instead of chucking them aside, instead of being like the scoffers who intentionally forget them. Will we take these reminders that come to us that the Lord has blessed us with seriously? even as the day approaches. Let us pray. Almighty God, today's passage, it's a simple message, dear Lord. I ask that as we listen to these words, and frankly, Lord, many of us here have heard this before. A hundred times, a thousand times maybe. Some of us here, Lord, might have grown weary of hearing that Christ comes again. Really? Ah. Lord, if this is us, Holy Spirit, may we heed your reminder. Lord, keep us far away from being a scoffer and instead help us remember and love your word. Lord, if we are sliding into sin, Holy Spirit, please bring us back. Holy Spirit, for those of us who are, pers who are ongoing and persevering, grant us perseverance as we live day by day, waiting for your return, doing our best in obedience, to live in obedience. Father, I pray that our hearts will not be cold. I pray that our hearts will be warm and inviting of your transformational work in our lives. Help us, dear Lord, heed your word. Help us heed your reminders. Help us remember your word and love it as we see the day approaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes.